In the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, we are presented with God's wonderful plan through the death and resurrection of Jesus to save for himself a diverse family of saints who are being transformed by Jesus to live like Jesus. This is Galatians, God's very good idea, and we are Mercy Village Church, located in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. I'm going to introduce you to Red Fred, not really, not literally. He is a friend of ours at the Bocal household, Uh, Isaiah, our oldest. He went through a phase where he really fell in love with snakes, which is weird, because that's my least favorite thing on the planet. Is snakes, and I mean like, I mean they petrify the, the snot out of me, hate them. But he fell in love with snakes for a while, he probably still likes them, but we got this plush red snake, it's bigger than he was, like four and a half feet tall, and he'd wrap that thing around them and carry it around with them everywhere, it's super cute. And that's what it was designed for, right? To be like a, a bed partner, right, for little kids, you know, to kind of hang out on there, look cute and all that. But if you have ever raised boys or been around somebody that raises has raised boys, you know that that wasn't the only way that Red Fred was going to get used in the Bokel house. Now, all of them have used Red Fred in various ways. Abraham probably is the most extreme. You see, Red Fred isn't just a uh, bed cuddle partner. Red Fred can also be nunchucks or uh, lasso or... I had to look it up. I didn't know what those things were called with the spiky ball at the end from like medieval times called a flail. Yeah, that thing can be a a flail. So you can meet Red Fred, cuddle, gentle, peaceful, or you can meet Red Fred's bulbous. The only thing on him that's, that's hard is those eyeballs. And if they make contact with your skull at the right speed, right. here's my point. Even good things can be wielded in bad ways. Paul understands this. Paul knows that. And so he's going to switch gears here as we move into verses 13 through 21 of of chapter 5. That even freedom, a good thing, freedom can be wielded in ways that are not good. In fact, the point that he's going to make overall is that that's actually not true True freedom. The point he wants us to see is that true freedom isn't found in doing whatever we want. That's not true freedom. True freedom is when we walk in step with the Spirit. He's been speaking about freedom from being under the law. Remember, the Judaizers have come into the churches of Galatia, if you've been with us, and they've tried to give the people the gospel plus. The gospel plus circumcision, the gospel plus dietary restrictions, the gospel plus sacred days. They try to add portions of the law to grace through faith, which nullifies grace through faith. And and Paul has been beating the drum for five chapters. You're free, you're free, you're free. And now he wants you to know that be careful, even with your freedom, right? We Humanity, the knuckleheads that we are, and I say that collectively, we're all together. That's not a a harsh term, that's a me term. That we can mess up good things. We can red fret our freedom, right? And use it in the in the wrong way. So, Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us, and what we have not, please give us by your good grace. Amen. Verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, sisters, only, be careful, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Legalism is not the only enemy to the gospel. Living according to a set of rules instead of living by grace through faith is not the only enemy to the gospel. There's another word, it's not said as much, or it hasn't been in this sermon series, licentiousness. It's where you take the license of freedom and you use it for whatever you want to get out of it. 
Instead of living as God has designed us to live in freedom, we engage in licentiousness. We use our freedom for ourselves. We selfishly engage that freedom. Freedom belongs to the children of God, but but don't go red Fred with it. Don't use it for yourself. Instead, the caution is, in love, serve one another. Uh, That's the pushback, by the way, to both legalism and licentiousness. If you're holding on to the law too deeply, then you're going to start, right? If you're, if you're legalistic, that means you're going to have a checklist of ways that you need to live your life. A, B, C. These things are what a Christian looks like and must do, okay? And after a while, if you start to kind of live up to that list, then you might get cocky. And if you keep failing at that list, you might get bitter and frustrated. And then it'll work its way in, and it'll kind of push out loving your neighbor, loving your brothers and sisters and serving them. But, but freedom can do the same thing if we're selfish with the freedom. If we treat freedom as something that allows us to get what we want when we want it, then we'll also fail to, in love, serve one another. So that's the check on both of them. Are we, in love, serving one another? Paul didn't Make this up, by the way, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And then he says multiple words. What he means is one idea. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't make that up either. That's not his thing. Notice the quotation marks. It points back to Matthew chapter 22. Uh, Someone comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. If you been with us for several months, and you remember when we preached a sermon on the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is a prayer that the people of God would pray daily. They would actually have it written in their their homes. From the time you were born and brought up, you would hear that prayer prayed over and over and over again. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He says, this is the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then he says something very dramatic. He says, on these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Everything in the Old Testament law, the Torah, everything that the prophets proclaimed as a word from God, it all hangs on these two commands, love God, love neighbor. It can sum it all up, right? So in that, Paul's getting after something that he's going to make even a little bit more explicit here in just a little bit. That even though we're no longer under the law or enslaved to the law, the general idea of the law still applies to us. That We are still to love God and love neighbor. Our freedom doesn't negate that reality. That we're to love God and love our neighbor. But not only is that obedience to God, but it's also for our joy and for our good. But, so the next verse kind of talks about the foolishness of living for ourselves. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. If you create a culture where you live for yourself at the expense of of others, don't be surprised that the people around you start living for themselves at the expense of you. If you step on people to get what you want, don't be surprised if people step on you to get what they want. That's the point he's driving home. It's not just that we're called by God to love God and love neighbor, and we're to obey that and to walk in that, but it also just makes sense. If you want to live a life free of people being selfish towards you, then you live a life where you're not selfish towards others. You've been there, by the way, maybe in a workplace or a marriage or even a church. We we have a term to excuse it away. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there, right? And we'll let that seep into our lives, by the way. I have. i got to... I gotta be aggressive in this situation and circumstance. And I, I'm not saying that we're never those things, right? But what I am saying is that the that the law is love God, love neighbor. 
That's where we start. That's what we fight for. That's what we look for in every, every situation. You see, the Beatles weren't really that far off when they said, love is all you need. Okay? Now, they missed that part about it being by grace through faith in Jesus that true love, real love, biblical love is found. They, they didn't have that part down, but, but love is essential. Real love is rooted, though, in grace through faith in, in Jesus. And it has to be, by the way. It has to be rooted in something bigger than us. It has to be rooted in something stronger than us because there's a battle that we face within us. Paul continues in verses 16 and 17. I, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's two things at odds inside of you if you're a Christian. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, to be clear, before Christ, all of you, down to the very fibers of your being, was against God. It wanted its own selfish way. Now that you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, you are being transformed. And that's not just a heart thing. Your desires, your thoughts, your actions are being transformed, but you're not there yet. None of us will be perfect in our physical responses to the gospel. None of us will be perfect in our mental responses to the gospel. None of us will be perfect in, uh, just in our flesh on this side of, of glory. So the caution is, right, remember that there's a part of you that's still going to want its own way. There's a part of you that's still going to desire things that are not of God. And so, so be careful. Because if you're going to love what God loves, and you're going to love what God loves, how God loves it, it's not going to be your flesh that pulls it off. It's going to have to be the Spirit. Spirit of God, the, the Holy Spirit at work in you, because true love is selfless. And the flesh, the old flesh, the old man apart from Christ, tends to be selfish. And the battle rages on. You, you fought it this week, by the way. We all did. I fought it this week. The Spirit said, Love. And the flesh said, Lash out. The Spirit said, repent, and your flesh, my flesh said, no, double down. The Spirit said, be intentional, and my flesh said, no, be distracted. Numb yourself with your phone, or whatever. The Spirit said, give yourself away, and, and the flesh said, no, get yours. Get what belongs to you. The Spirit said, love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, mind, and strength. And the flesh said, nah. Go get your desires. The, the Spirit said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the flesh said, no, love yourself like you love yourself. We all fought that battle this week. I fought that battle this morning. I doubt I'm the only, the only one, but that doesn't sound like freedom, Right? Because we have this modern day misunderstanding of what freedom is. We've come to believe somehow, even though it makes no logical sense, that freedom means getting whatever we want. Being able to do absolutely anything that we want to do, but the spirit pushes back against our flesh and says, no, true freedom is found in walking in step with the spirit. How do we make sense of that? Well, Tim Keller has a, I mean, a lot of great books, a lot of great writing. This one is called Making Sense of God, and he, he goes into this. He says, imagine a man in his 60s. Who could imagine such a man, by the way? His 60s, wow. I mean, but imagine that if you can. Imagine a man in his 60s who likes to eat whatever he wants to eat. Okay? Probably not very hard. I'll be that man. You can imagine me in my 60s. I'll be that guy. But he also loves to spend time with his grandchildren. Both of these activities are an important part of what makes his daily life meaningful and satisfying. 
But then one day at his annual physical, the doctor says to him, unless you severely restrict what you eat from now on, your heart problems will worsen and you will have a heart attack. You must completely stop eating all of your favorite foods. Well, what now? Right? If freedom says I can do whatever I want, the modern definition of freedom is the ability to do whatever we want. However, how does that definition work out when your wants are in conflict with each other? He certainly does not want to be bedridden or to die. That would certainly uh, cut in on his ability to be with his grandchildren. But of course, he also wants to eat his favorite foods. Eating and, uh, is a major source of his comfort and good feeling. That's the complexity of this life. The freedom to do whatever you want doesn't really exist. It's a unicorn. It's not real. You can accept it. If you didn't know unicorns were fake, I just ruined it. I'm sorry. <laughs> he can accept you. It's true. He can accept either the limits of his eating or the limits of his health. So the question is this, Tim Keller says. The question is not, how can this man live in complete freedom? The proper question is, which freedom is more important? Which freedom is more truly liberating? We all understand this intuitively, right? If you want the freedom of being a doctor, then when you approach the education, right, of being a, if that's the freedom you desire, what, for whatever reason... To be free to help people in those ways, to be maybe it's the money, whatever it is, right? All those parts. Then you're going to have to restrict some other freedoms for about 12 years of your life, pretty severely, to get to that freedom. If you're an athlete or an artist who desires to to have the freedom of of being a, an elite one of those, you're going to have to restrict a whole lot of your freedoms. He finishes with this way. He says, if you see a large sailboat out in the water moving swiftly, it is because the sailor is honoring the boat's design. If she tries to take it into water too shallow for it, the boat will be ruined. The sailor experiences the freedom of speed and sailing only when she limits her boat to the proper depth of water and faces the wind at the proper angle. In the same way human beings, us, thrive in certain environments, but we break down in others. Unless you honor the givens and the limits of your physical nature, you will never know the freedom of health. Unless you honor the givens and limits of human relationships, you will never know the freedom of love and social peace. If you actually lived any way you wanted, never aligning your choices with those, these physical and social realities, you would quickly die, and you would die alone. You then are not free to do whatever you choose. That is an impossible idea, and not the way freedom actually works. You get the best freedom only when you are willing to submit your choices in various realities to honor your own design. And God has designed us to walk and step with the Spirit. And the greatest freedom that we will find is when we walk in step with the Spirit. Which is different than being under the law. He says if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That doesn't mean the law doesn't guide us and still teach us. Spurgeon says it like this. Some men of, uh, hold God's law like a rod. That's what the Judaizers were trying to do. They hold it in terror over top of Christians, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. The law is under the Christian. It is for him to walk on, to be his guide. We are not under the law, but under grace. Paul wants us to remember this because what he's about to do is he's about to show us some signs of what it looks like to walk according to the flesh and what it looks like to walk according to the Spirit. He's going to list out all these evidences. And at the end of these lists, you're going to be tempted, we are going to be tempted to say, well, I need to do all those things. Check, 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 check. I want to go back and be under the law. This, this will be my new standard of, of living. You say, no. Live according to the Spirit. And if you live according to the Spirit, the work of Christ in you will be these things. Or, as we're about to see, 
if Christ is not in you, the list will look a little different. Now, I'm going to warn you, we're finishing on a bummer today because we're only going to look at the evidences of walking according to the flesh. And next week, we'll come back and look at the list of things that evidence us walking according to the Spirit. So we're going to kind of close out on a low note. Everybody leave depressed and sad. I hope not. Here's his list. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, he says. They're obvious. What he means by that is, in the dark of the night, right, if you're living according to these ways habitually to fulfill you and satisfy you, there's a still small voice written, wired into all of us that's going to say, this isn't enough. This doesn't satisfy. This doesn't make me happy. This isn't bringing me joy. It's evident. It's obvious. The works of the flesh are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Big list. Quite a list. We'll break it down into four categories, just kind of wrap our heads around what he's doing here. We're kind of go from the obvious to the subtle. What you're going to see is most of what he's talking about here has to do with relationships. Now, you got some big ticket items on there that get everybody's attention, right? He wants to talk about orgies and, and sexual immorality, but but the vast majority of that is how you treat other people in your life. But we'll start with the, with the more obvious ones, the things that we think of as the evil things. Like, these are, the, these are so bad. He starts with, with drunkenness and, and orgies, and we kind of get drunkenness, right? Some of us maybe a little too well. We understand what that is. And the other word, though, we may misunderstand just a little bit because we tend to sexualize everything in American culture, and and the word is far beyond just that, although it certainly includes a, a sexualized undertone. But, but it's about this unbridled catering to urges. That's really what that word is all about, this uninhibited indulging in the things that bring you pleasure. Maybe you're at some parties like that in, in your college days. It was just whatever, anything goes, right? Just whatever you want. To consume whatever you want to experience, you just engage in it. But most of us, right, especially if we're in our 30s or 40s, we haven't been to a party like that in a while because we don't want to die. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we well, sleep on Friday nights. We're in bed. So that may seem very distant to us, but I think we certainly can, not directly, but loosely apply it to the fact that we do like to indulge in things, though. We might, we might binge on something, right? And sometimes that's healthy, but sometimes there's other things in life that we need to be attentive to and instead we choose to, to indulge in, in certain things. The next set of words that have to do with sexual ethic and, and practice, he, he says sexual immorality, which is just a general idea of unfaithfulness to, to God's design for marriage. Like that, that when we go outside of marriage, in particular with sex, that that is what the word is, is there, sexual immorality. Impurity can be physical, but it also is a mental idea. It's, it's like a dirty, dirty mind, right? These are the private sins. That's what you would find here. That's what the church speak for, for porn, right? Or things like that. What you do in the secret. No one else is around. Uh, by the way, porn is an enemy of God. And it's an enemy of women. And it's an enemy of men. And it's an enemy of true freedom. So, so know that today. Hear that today. Sensuality, the idea here is using your sexuality to manipulate others. Whether that's like actually su seduction or if it's just flirting to get what you want. So that's in that word there. It's not just women who do that, by the way. I think that that should go without saying, but it doesn't. Men do this kind of stuff all the time, kind of get a pass on it. And that's not really fair, and certainly not biblical. right? So these apply to all of us. Second set of, or the third set of words is, 
They have to do with worship and religiosity. He, he talks about idolatry and, and sorcery. Sorcery comes from a word that actually can be translated into kind of the pharmacy realm, which is interesting because a lot of people will sometimes apply this to like drug use. And, and that certainly can, can, can fall in there, but that also can fall under that drunkenness category, that kind of indulging in things like you want to. Another way to understand this, and it would have been applicable in, in that day, right? And it could go either way, but I'm just trying to give you the full robust meaning of the word, is the actual pagan satanic and cult rituals that would have been uh, in that, that day and age. <coughs> Casting of spells, seances, things like that. There's a revival of that type of thing in our society, right? So, so take note of, of that. And idolatry hits closer to home. We get that. It could be the worship of graven images, but it also could be worshiping anything instead of Jesus. So work can be an idolatry. If, if you care more about your work than you do about the things of God, material things or even family or sports can be an idolatry if they become all-consuming parts of your identity and your, your life. We're made to worship. All of us are. And we will worship. But your flesh will try to get you to worship posers. Not the real God, but things other than God. And then lastly, the category of relationships. Now notice this, right? Because those first three things, right? Like I said, those are like your headliners. Like everybody wants to, to talk about those things. But over half of the items listed have to do with interpersonal relationships. How we treat people love people, receive people. What we do in those relationships matter. I've kind of broken them down into there's external actions and there's internal attitudes. Externally, there's strife, the quarreling and, and picking of fights. Maybe you're sometimes this type of person or you've been around a person who's kind of like this. You say, you, you really look nice today. And they say, are you saying I didn't look nice yesterday? You know, like everything is like a fight. Like they try to pick a fight with anything. Quarreling, picking fights, fits of anger. This is explosive rage, either ver verbally or, or physically. I've been guilty of this. Just that, that explosion of anger that just erupts out, usually towards the people you love the most. Ever chewed out a two-year-old, right? I can show you how to do that. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not healthy. Divisions. This literally means, in the Greek, the seizure of your own preferences. You want to tank a relationship, you try to get what you want in every single situation. You try to have your preferences be brought to bear in everything. Where you eat, uh, how things go in the workplace, how things go between you and your neighbor, everything. You just try to seize your preferences every time you, you watch a tank. There's internal attitudes, though, that are not as easy to see, like enmity. That's the opposite of love, hostility towards others, jealousy. That's angst, angst against other people's success. And then envy is an ill will, right? You're not just jealous of other people's success, but you actually are rooting for them to, to fail. Our con concern should be both with the external and the internal. There's two other interesting words, though, that, that I want to throw in here last, because in the Greek they have political connotations. They tend to, to work their way into writing, not just by biblical authors, but by other authors in ancient Greek, to political themes, rivalries, which is a selfish devotion to one's own interest, and dissensions, which is rebellion and rabble-rousing, not for a just cause, but for a self-glory cause. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on in society, right? Are people being stirred up for something just, or are they being stirred up so that somebody else can gain power and influence. and It's not always easy to, to tell. I saw this quote the other day, David Brooks, he's a columnist in the New York Times, but he said over the last half century we've turned politics from a practical way to solve common problems into a cultural arena to display resentments. That's what, it's, that's what politics in many ways have become. And that doesn't mean we stop engaging. We need to engage, but we engage as reasonable people who are led by love for, for God and love for neighbor. We don't engage in these things, right? It can become a, a, uh, a religious type thing, the way we engage politics. 
in these days. And I want to caution us from that. Where it becomes less about like legislation and more about uh, performing your zeal. Like these politics tell you who I am and And these politics tell you how great of a person I am. And I love the right things. And people who vote this way love the wrong things. And and division can come in very, very quickly. And and, and, and hear both sides of that. That's not me saying don't be involved. But it's me saying come to those things right fervently, certainly. Engage politically if that's what you feel led to and called to. But do so led first and foremost by love for God and love for people. Don't come in there with selfish devotion to your own interest or, or the desire to rebel or, or raise a, a rabble of people for your own self-glory. It's not helping. If we're not careful, we'll get caught up in this quasi-religious world of modern politics, but might we engage it as it is, secondary to the gospel. Um, and in case Paul didn't fit you in, he finishes saying, and things like these. So you're probably on the list. I was. But if you weren't on the list, he says, and things like these, so you can kind of add yourself in to the list. Here's the bad news. The shocking news. He says, as I warned you before, the last time on my missionary journey, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What? That's harsh. Right? Like, I get it with the orgies. Okay. But envy? Why does it have, Envy can keep me from inheriting the kingdom of God. Well, cautionary note here. Those who do in the original Greek carries with it, just because of its tenses and its way of being written, the habitual engagement in, not the occasional the occasional lapse into those things. All of us will fail more than we want to. All of us will walk according to the flesh at times. Even as Christians, we will not always walk according to the Spirit. Sometimes envy will mark our lives, or fits of rage may show up in our lives, but the question is, are you convicted of it? Do you repent? Do you return to your father so that he can pick you up and put you back together and empower you to go on your way? Jesus told a story once of a boy, a young boy who was in his adolescence and and grew up to the point where he was ready to throw off the rule of his father. And so he asked for his inheritance. And his dad gave it to him. Not too long after, a few days later, the young man gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. He took his freedom and he red fretted it, man. He used it in the wrong way. He didn't just hurt others. He hurt himself. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was so hungry. He turned his freedom into slavery real quick because he'd leveraged his freedom for himself instead of living in step with the Spirit. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. He tried to live according to his his own desires and and his freedom turned into slavery. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? He believed the false definition of freedom a few months ago. That he needed to throw off the shackles of his loving father's rules and regulations and thoughts towards him and he got his inheritance and he went out and he used his freedom as he desired but now he longs to be back in the comfort and the presence of his father because now he knows that was true freedom that was what freedom was like that's the better freedom 
So he says, I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He's ready to repent. He's got a contrite and broken heart. God will not refuse a contrite and broken heart. So he, he rose. He came to his father. He gets me every time. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Right? The man who had lived according to the flesh instead of a living according to the spirit, when the father saw him, he didn't say, All right, I got a list of all the violations. Right? Come here. I told you, idiot. I saw this coming a mile away. <laughs> I'm older and wiser than you, son. He felt compassion. And he ran. Which insinuates, right, that he'd come out every day to look for his boy, right? Because he knew it. He did know it. He knew his son would be back, or at least hoped that his son would be back. He knew he was going to crash. He was waiting for him. He embraced him and he kissed him and the son has his speech prepared. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father shh, 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 says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead. He was living according to the flesh and it destroyed him, but he's back with his father now. He is alive again. He was lost, and he is found, and they began to celebrate. That's your father's heart towards you today. There's two types of people I want to talk to. There are those who are not Christians. Maybe you're here today, and you're not a Christian. You're lost and far from God. This is good news for you. There's a father in heaven who, who waits for you, longs for for you, desires you to be with him. Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Right? That sounds like a backwoods Baptist minister, but look what happens next. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It's not just get out from under this angry God who's going to crush you for your sins. Yes, repent. You must. You must own your sinfulness and have it forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But with that comes the loving arms of the Father. Renewal, refreshment for your soul. You can actually be home. Where your heart was always meant to be with your, with your Father. Trust Jesus today if you're not a Christian. If you have any questions about what that looks like, please, please talk to me. I'd love to answer them. And then, child of God, it's good news for us too. Because we fail to live according to the Spirit. We oftentimes live according to the flesh, but our Father is patient with us. He loves us, and He desires our good, and He waits for us to bless us. So reject, like that prodigal son had to do, eventually, your version of freedom. You can hold that list up against your, your life, as a self-assessment, not as a legalistic list of do's and don'ts, but say, hey, am I in this list anywhere? Right? Are there evidences in my life of me rejecting uh, the Father's version of freedom? you got to be real and honest with yourself about that. There's other lists, and there's other... I mean, the, the character of God is revealed all through Scripture, and so you can hold yourself up against it, not to gain righteousness, but to gain that reality and understanding that your version of freedom is not always in line with your father's version of freedom. And where it doesn't line up with your father's version of freedom, keep rejecting that and pushing back against it. And receive your father's true freedom. Next week we'll see exactly what that looks like. The fruits of the Spirit. I've been excited to get to this the whole time we've been in this letter. What it looks like practically for us to walk in the freedom that is ours in Christ. But he gave us a clue this week of what it looks like. Through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. Might that be the marker of our lives? 
that because of the grace that has been given to us, we in turn serve others lovingly. True freedom isn't found when we do whatever we want, but when we walk in step with the Spirit. Father, thank you that you waited for me, and you still wait for me. That your forgiveness and mercy and grace is infinitely greater than any of my uh, times where I walk according to the flesh. Help us not to, to live in freedom licentiously, like, okay, forgiveness is mine, I'll do what I want. But help us to lean into it for forgiveness and then to lean into your strength to walk more in step with the Spirit. That we'd be marked by righteousness, and as we'll see next week, it will be marked by the fruits of the Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone, and we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.